I think it's easy to ask what your favorite interview is, but I'm actually interested to know what your favorite moment is of any of these interviews you've done. I like that question. Um, I mean, that's not my favorite moment because you're doing the interview, but I do like the question. Um, <laughs> my, uh, no, my favorite moment, actually, it's, it's definitely this moment I had interviewing Shawn Michaels. Sam Roberts, what's the haps? I love that. That's such a great way to start. I feel I'll tell you like where you're going. OK, I'll start with what's the haps. The only <laughs> thing I can think of is like, OK, how do I start? How, what soundbite am I going to try to add in that he'll use as the preview soundbite at the beginning of the interview? Like I'm trying to think of something. Oh, you're going to create the soundbite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just something wow. authentic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just something that I'll sneak in there knowing like, OK, I know that was good. He'll use that at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, when when I'm editing the interviews, I have no idea what soundbite's going to be at the start for like 99% of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just decide like later, like as you're going, you're like, oh, I guess that. Yeah. That I'm makes- like, yeah, that works. Sure. Yeah. Uh, very nice studio that you have. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, you know, I feel like uh, I feel like people think that I'm much smarter than I am because I was ready for the lockdown when everybody had to work from home. I was like, yeah, I got this studio in my house. But, you know, I I built this studio as soon as my wife and I moved into a house out of an apartment. It was like a priority. It was like we need what I I said to Jess. I was like, whatever, wherever you want to live, I don't care. Whatever house you want to move into, I don't care. You can have the bottom floor and then rights all the way to the sky. You could do whatever you want with the house. It just has to have a basement that I can build a studio in and you have no access and no rights to the basement. And she was like, all right, that's it. That's it. Hold on. You live in New York city and own a house. Like how no, much are they no. paying you? Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No. This is, yeah. This is all that sweet WWE money. This is serious. Money. This is, no, I, uh, I'm smart enough not to live in New York city. I live in the suburbs. Do you live in the state of New York? I live in, yeah, I live in New York. I just, I live like 25 minutes outside of the city. Okay, because there's a lot of people that say they work in New York and then live in Connecticut or live in Jersey. No, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, I guess I'm technically part of the bridge and tunnel crowd because Manhattan is an island, but I, I am in state. It is, I'm in Westchester, New York. Okay. So, you know, this is like, this is, yeah, this is the closest suburb to the city without going out of state. Technically, living in New Jersey is probably closer, but it's living in New Jersey. Well, so, you own a house with a studio. That's all that matters. That's it. Yeah, that's it. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Uh, you know, and our paths have crossed many times. I think that uh, your videos have definitely been on the recommended section of my videos <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. But I feel like our careers have like a lot of similarities. We're the same age and our, our careers kind of like are very aligned in that we went to school for broadcasting, an internship turned into a job. Our love of wrestling was able to be sprinkled into there. And here we are having this conversation. Yeah, so here's the difference, though. Your YouTube channel caught fire when like there were a lot of people on YouTube and my YouTube channel caught fire before that. So you actually timed it much better. Well, I'm going to be honest. It was your channel and Peter Rosenberg's channel that I was like, I, I was inspired by. I saw what you guys were doing. We all kind of like worked in that same world. We had quote unquote, real broadcasting jobs and access to these, you know, incredible people that we were having conversations with. And we kind of went, well, let's put those things online. And I saw what you guys were doing and I went, oh, they're getting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views. I can do the same thing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And I saw too, like really early on, like, you know, I've seen your stuff forever, like before it was, you know, a thing. And like, I knew exactly, I could tell what you were doing because it really was the same thing I was doing. Same thing Rosenberg was doing, which is, like you were working in news, superstars would come and do an interview for the news channel. And you'd be like, well, I'm a big wrestling fan while you're here. Can I get 20 minutes to just talk wrestling and I'll throw it on the internet and boom, yeah, there you go. That's what I was doing with the radio show. That's what I think Peter was doing on radio. It's like, uh, and you realize that, oh, like, it's just one of those things when you realize like there was this, this thing that was just sitting on the table the whole time. Yep. And all you had to do was pick it up. It was right there. Yep. It wasn't even like you had to, it was right there for you. You just sort of like, oh, I just saw this thing on the table. And I guess it's my table. So I'll, <laughs> that's I'll right. And, and, and nobody else was really doing it. And that was the other mm-hmm. thing. Like I was having these in-depth, insightful conversations with 
all kinds of celebrities, comedians, musicians, you name it. And then every once in a while, as you know, wrestling would come to town, whether it was WWE or Impact or Ring of Honor. And then they would, of course, pitch like, can we come in and promote the show? I always got a lot of pushback from my news directors. Like, come on, like wrestling on the news. Like people don't really care. I'm like, no, no, no I'm a huge fan. Like this will work. You do these five, 10, 15 minute interviews and only air 15, 20 second clip on TV. And I'm like, well, I, but I had this great interview where I asked all these questions I cared about as a fan. And that's when I was like, it needs to live somewhere. And yeah. that's when I put it on YouTube. And then I saw what you guys were doing. And I went, oh, there is an audience for this. Yeah, I had a similar experience. Like I was out. I remember it was when, you know, WWE would do press conferences and stuff for WrestleMania and they'd be at the Hard Rock in Times Square or whatever. And like, I remember, like, I think somebody was coming in. I was working uh, for Opie and Anthony at the time. And somebody came in promoting WrestleMania the same day as the press conference, because literally, you know, that we're in Times Square when we were yeah. you know, there. So the publicist there was like, oh, are you coming to the press conference later? And I was like, what do you mean? That's for the press. And they're like, yeah. And I was like, oh, that's you. <laughs> I like I didn't put two and two together like that is. Yeah. Oh, I can go to that. And they're like, you could go to any of them. You would. Yeah, of course. That's why we do them. I was like, oh, OK. And so I went. And then at first it was like, I'm going to try to get sound bites and maybe like, I'll you know, make a fool of myself and they'll play them on Opie and Anthony. And that'll be the goal. Yeah. And then it was the same thing. It was like, well, I don't know if I'm going to get any soundbite out of this guy. So, I mean, I'm here. I might as well just video an interview with him, even if it's five minutes where I just, yeah. I mean, I'm like, if it's Edge, right? Like, oh my God, I get to talk to Edge. Like, let me just talk to Edge for five minutes and then put it on YouTube. And then all yeah. of a sudden you realize, you know, the same thing, that there is this audience, this huge audience that's sitting there going like, yeah, I want to watch wrestling interviews. And I was like, oh, well, maybe I should just do that then. But, but when we started putting these on YouTube, there wasn't, like YouTube wasn't what it was. Mm -hmm. I started my channel nine years ago. YouTube wasn't this thing. And I think in the perception of the broadcasting world that you and I came from, you were on TV, you were on the radio, you were on you know broadcasting. And if you came in and said, I've got this blog, I've got this YouTube channel, they kind of go, oh, that's, that's really cute. <laughs> now yeah. those people are crushing it. And us in the broadcasting world are like kind of trying to play catch up. Yeah, we're just doing whatever we can to get some of these YouTube plaques. Like, like, yeah, that, that's, that's the new marker. Like, people are looking at your background, going like, I don't know what those trophy things are, holding a thing up, or I don't know what that is. <laughs> but is that a YouTube plaque right there? And you're like, I spoke at a high school, and uh, you know, I have four Emmys. I'm obviously very proud of that. And I said, oh yeah, I've, I've been very grateful to win four Emmys. Oh, that's cool. And uh, I recently won us or got a silver play button on YouTube. Ah! Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's your point exactly yeah yeah and you realize like oh and you know and that was part of it too like in in radio even though satellite radio i feel like was a little bit ahead of the curve because on satellite radio you can kind of do shows that sound more like podcasts sound yeah. like today because you're not hitting you know breaks at certain times and programming to a local audience and doing all that stuff uh but still it was like i it, it was it was that that made me realize like, oh, getting content out on the internet and creating content that is just for the internet is a really important part of this, especially as you look at how the industry's changing. Yeah, so for you, if we take it back here, when did you know that you wanted to be a broadcaster? Um, I, I mean, it went, I, I, I liked wrestling and I liked, I liked broadcasting, I liked, talking but i like talking about the things that i liked it was just the, the it was just what attracted me to it um in high school i was listening to howard stern and i was listening to opie and anthony a lot and it still wasn't one of these things like i didn't have the kind of brain in high school that was like oh yeah you can go do that that's possible like you would yeah. just hear the people that worked on the show and you go it's just a thing that happens to some people like i'm gonna have to figure out what kind of job i want to get and, you know, slowly but surely, like I, I'm very obsessive. I think people have figured that out by now with the things that I'm into. So, I mean, I kind of just surrounded myself with wrestling and I surrounded myself with the radio shows that I liked and 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 everything. And and I went to Syracuse and they had radio stations there that you could be on. So I was like, yeah, I, I could I could I could do a college radio show. That would be awesome. And then I started learning more about internships and I got my radio internship and I was like, yeah. And 
you know, and you and you kind of this whole process has been a, a, a just a learn by doing like you, you, you go, you know, on some level, this is what you want to do. Yeah. But you, you wouldn't be so audacious as to say, I'm going to do that because you have no idea how it's done. Yeah. And like step one kind of presents itself to you and you're like, oh, yeah, I, I want to do step one just because I want to do it. And then there's step two. And you're like, yeah, I would love to do that. Like, I would love to have an internship at one of these radio shows that I listen to. And then you start to pay attention to the people you meet there. And you're like, oh, this is all possible. And you just kind of surround yourself with the people that are doing the things that you like and the people that are doing things that you'd like to be doing. And, and you learn their stories and you just kind of pay attention to the world around you and you, you follow that path, you know? Well, it's shifted so much. I mean, now if someone wants to start a podcast or wants to start a YouTube channel, you literally just push a couple of buttons. Next Great. thing you know, yeah. you're doing it. Yeah. To, to work in broadcasting, there's, I mean, you skipped over a lot of the steps there of like how this thing actually works. Like you don't just get an internship, like oh, you have yeah, to work I mean, to get an internship. Dude, so like, yeah, just getting an internship, just that piece of the puzzle. It was just like, you figure out that internships exist, right? That's, like, that's okay. a huge piece. Yeah. It's, that's because that's your foot in the door. That's yep. where it's like, if I can get my foot in the door, then that's, that's something tangible. That's where I can start to go from. And man, I mean, I was sitting there in Syracuse going like, okay, it was my junior year. And I was like, I, ha I'm, I gotta get an internship this summer. So in September, I compiled like a list of radio stations that I wanted to work at in New York as an intern and put together a CD of my college radio show and put together a resume and sent out packages to like, I don't know, eight, 10, 12 different radio stations and shows. And then, and it was for the next summer. It was like for, you know, in 10 months, I want to get an internship. And then three months after that, I sent the exact same set of packages to the exact same people. And then three months after that, sent the exact same set of packages to the exact same set of people. And all told, I finally got one singular response from everything. Wow. And it was like, and it was- And that was May. Opie and, An and, that was and, Opie it was and Anthony? And Anthony, yeah. That's yeah, a pretty good show to get back to you. It was the one that I wanted. It was like, I, I didn't even, it didn't even bother me that none of, I was happy that none of the others had gotten back to me after that. Cause then I would have had to make, you know, a decision and I might've made the wrong one, but that was where I, that was my favorite radio show anyway. So I was like, this is, this is perfect. Were you at Syracuse the same time as Ariel Hawani? I think he was there before. For me, like or maybe really, you had a year or two that crossed. I don't know. I just maybe, figured, yeah, he might have been, know. yeah, he might have been older because I don't, I don't think he's that much older than us. us. But, yeah, I think yeah, he maybe, but, maybe a year or two older. Yeah, I mean, we never crossed paths in Syracuse, so that's why I assume. But, but I also didn't go to broadcasting school, so right. Know, I just what were you in, studying? Well, I ended up with a degree in sociology. Um, oh, that's helpful. Yeah. Sorry. But, no, I, I'm sorry. I took many sociology classes. I, I figured that if I graduated from Syracuse, people would assume I graduated from Newhouse, the broadcasting school, which is like a great broadcasting school. And they do. So, you know, I get it's fine. <laughs> You've tricked everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but getting the getting the internship with opening and, and Anthony is, I mean, it's a big move, but then you have to actually move. Then you actually have to go to New York City. That's a... That's a huge step to take. Well, yeah. So, I mean, I got it in the summer. So, you know, that summer uh, I was living, uh, you know, I'm from Westchester. So, you know, I, I was living in Westchester and just commuting into the city every day. But I was, you know, I started that lifestyle of waking up at, you know, and when it's the middle of the night still, three, four in the morning, whatever it is, getting into the city and going in every day, like not trying to figure out like, okay, well, I'm an intern. So I'm going to have to be here three days a week. Like I was in there every day and kind of committed the entire summer to that. It was my number one focus in everything. I would go home after the show and try to figure out ways to get some kind of content on the air, or just, just provide value. You know, yeah. I think that, that it's not about, you know, getting air time or getting FaceTime. It's like, I, my mentality was I, I really want to provide value as much value as I possibly can in the next three months so that when I'm gone, it's there's a lack there like that value is gone and and, and there's a realization that oh sam provided a value yeah. um and i you know hopefully i was successful but the other key thing was that after the internship uh they said that if i was local they would have brought me back for another semester but because i'm going to be in syracuse you know it doesn't 
that re- it wouldn't happen. Like I can't commute from Syracuse to New York City every yeah. day. But when they said that, I was like, oh, no, I almost dropped out of school. But, you know, luckily I did not. But I did start driving back to New York City every time I had more than a day off. So, Mm -hmm. like, if I had more than a three day weekend, if I had a Thursday and a Friday off, I would Wednesday night drive to the city and I would just show up and work on Thursday and Friday at Opie and Anthony. And I spent my whole Christmas vacation there and I spent my whole spring break there and I spent like every possible day I could that I wasn't in school I was there and like the week between finals and graduation I was there you know I drove back to the city instead of you know partying with everybody I drove back to the city worked for free for Opie and Anthony and then like the day of the graduation ceremony basically so that my parents could go I drove back (laughs) did the little graduation deal and then drove right back to the city so I could be there on Monday for the radio show but that that to me, I mean, I was really lucky, I think, that I found something that I could sink my teeth into that much that early. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, I mean, it was and it's a you're right. It's a really long, slow process. But yeah. I mean, I always just believed in sticking to the process. But you already had I mean, you were still in college, but you had one foot in the quote unquote real world, which I think is so helpful. A lot of interns never make it on air, whether that's in television or radio. So how long into your internship till they gave you, you know, a few seconds of airtime? I mean, I was my first day. I had a few seconds of airtime, but it was OK. Really, really, That's really, huge. Really, it was huge. I mean, I saved the tape. I asked them to make me an MP3. I was like, oh, my God. And it was literally just a new video game had come out and Anthony wanted it. And so he needed an intern to go get it for him because he didn't want to have to wait after the show. And <laughs> and and I was that intern so they asked they were like they asked me what my name was they made fun of me for a second and then they gave me money and sent me to the video game store and i'm telling you like i did not and this is i i was running through new york city trying to make it back to the studio before the show went off the air because i knew if i got back to the studio before the show went off the air i would have another couple of seconds on the air where i could give him the video game yeah but I didn't, I mean, I like I came back to the studio all sweaty and the show had ended like two minutes before I got back. But And then from that day on, were you on the air frequently? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it started slowly but surely. But you know, I would I would I would come in with stuff every day. Like I mean I, I remember like I think Hogan knows best was premiering at that time. Like it was the first episode of Hogan Knows Best. So I, I cut up clips as I was watching the show and brought him in the next day. And I was like, oh, you guys got to see this show. Here's some audio clips from this show. Wow. And the way that show would work at the time is if I was bringing in content, they would get me to come into the studio and explain it, which was really a trick, which is a great trick because what it would be is if the segment didn't work, then they could, they could just destroy me on the air and they would still have a good segment. Right. But if the segment did work, then, you know, I got to, I got to leave without being destroyed. So, <laughs> <laughs> so who was the first, the who was the first wrestling interview that you got to do? Um, and how long into this whole process was that? I mean, it certainly was after the internship. Okay. You know, I, I had been around, you know, the first, so the first, one of the, there were two things, like two big breaks. I feel like that got me, consistently on the air to some degree and got me to like kind of show my personality a little bit on the air. The first was when they realized that I had a really picky diet and it was even worse when I was younger. And so I would have like fish sticks for dinner and I I like I'd eat little kid food, even though I was in my twenties. And so they bring me on the air every day. They'd ask me what I had for dinner and they make fun of me. But the, the, they also knew what a big wrestling fan I was and what a big Mick Foley fan I was. So kind of the climax of that bit was that they had Mick Foley come in studio and feed me steak like a baby. Like, you know, (laughs) here comes the airplane. And, you know, and then they watch me gag on it and just have the worst time ever in front of my idol. So that was like the first interaction. And then the second sort of thing that I got on the air a lot for was uh, I when they blew up Vince McMahon in a limo. Yes. And uh, like they were laughing about it on the air and they were like, I wonder how Sam's doing. And they brought me in and without even thinking about it, they were like, Sam, what's going on? I was like, things aren't good. They're like, what's wrong? I was like, 
Vince McMahon blew up last night. <laughs> they were like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? I was like, he's he's gone. He blew up. He, Kari was him blew up and just like played it so straight the whole time. And and the week of the, that that bit was happening in WWE, like WWE.com was putting up updates throughout the week as to what's what the conditions are with with Mr. McMahon. And and they said I think there was one that like they said the Federal Investigation Council is investigating it. And so I went on the air the next day. I was like, guys, this is legit. The Federal Investigation Council is on it. They were like, the what? I was like, the, the FIC? They were like, the F, the FIC. I was like, yeah, guys, this is this is serious. <laughs> so those are probably the the first the first two kind of incidents of 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 wrestling, you know, seeping into that world. Well, I think at the heart of all of this is you made yourself irreplaceable. You went in with a plan of like, I am going to find a way one way or another to turn this internship into a job. And maybe, maybe the initial plan wasn't to make that internship a job there, but it was, I'll get enough stuff here. I'll get enough content here so that I can get a job somewhere from this internship. And best case scenario for you, you ended up getting hired at the same place you got an internship at. Yeah. And it was definitely the goal. I mean, pretty quickly, I was like, this is, this is the type of, of radio I want to be doing. This is the yeah. In creative environment I want to be in um yeah it was it was definitely and and I, I was thinking like okay if this doesn't work out I do need to like you say build a build some kind of resume and catalog of content that that proves my value elsewhere but it would definitely working there was definitely the goal at the time I think what's so amazing is you went from intern there to eventually executive producer of the show so you went from the absolute <laughs> bottom rung to the absolute top rung. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, uh, there is a lot to be said about just not leaving, just being that cockroach that just never, just never leaves. Eventually, they'll look at you and they'll be like, well, Sam's still here. We, we can do something with Sam. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. That was all it was. I'm sure, yeah. 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 Just me just sitting there for 10 years and they were like, okay, all right, let's make him executive producer. Is there something that you learned from Opie and Anthony that you still apply to your broadcasting career every day? Yeah, I mean, and it actually helps in WWE too. I mean, Opie and Anthony's ability, it was a very, I, I, it was a very underproduced show, not in the sense that there weren't producers making content all the time, but in the sense that it was not planned out in any right. way, shape or form. Like those guys would just show up with four hours of airtime in front of them and just make up the show as they went. And they had stuff they could pull from at all times, but it wasn't like this regimented thing where we knew, okay, every Monday at 8.30, this is what we're gonna do. And we have to prepare that segment and we have to prepare this. It was just like, be ready for anything at all times. And, you know, watch as these guys are able to turn nothing, literally nothing into a hilarious four hour radio show every day. And I think that that's, that's probably the thing that I took away the most. And I would imagine they're on your list of like broadcasters that, I mean, you listed a few of them, but, but, but broadcasters that you looked up to growing up, but who oh, else yeah. was there? Opie, 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 I can't even say it. Opie and it, Anthony. It's always been difficult for people. Howard Stern, <laughs> who else is on this list? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely Opie and Anthony, Howard Stern. I mean, really like, I grew up listening to wrestling commentators, obviously. So oh, like, so who are your favorites there? I mean, people, I mean, look, I grew up with Vince McMahon on commentary. Like, so, you know, there's something about what a maneuver. Like there's something about that that, that, that brings me right. It like holds this place in my heart where I go, yeah, that's what it sounds like. But I mean, like, yeah, Randy Savage and, and Vince McMahon always held a place in my heart. I think, you know, if you go back and listen now, Bobby Heenan is like such a genius in that position yeah. and so far ahead of his time. Um, I think Roddy Piper was really, really good in that position. Um, Gorilla Monsoon is so good, you know. So, I mean, those guys were, they, they permeated through my childhood. So, you know, they, they, they were big for me. I feel like we kind of skipped over the part where it was like, who was your first wrestling interview? Right. Okay. So, like, yeah. So, um, so yeah, Mick Foley and stuff were happening. So, like, I guess, MVP came in during his first run. And to this day, it's so funny. Like there are a handful of guys that have known me for a really long time and they remember me a certain way. And then there are much, many more people that have just gotten to know me now. And they like, they look at me completely differently. Sure. Because when MVP came in, 
I had to I had to interview him on the show, except they made me read the questions that they wrote for me. Oh, and it no. was like the most humiliating. And I literally had to look at this guy who I never met before. And he remembers to this day how funny it was. But like I had to look at him right in the eye and, stand, oh. and he's standing and I'm looking at him face to face and I go, Mr. MVP, what's more fun, WWE or jail? <laughs> oh, wow. Don't make me. And he just and he just looked at me and I'm like, no, 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 no. Did you tell him the setup? Did you tell him that these weren't your questions? He saw me reading them and it was live as it was happening. So he knew what was going on. Okay. Luckily, thank God, you know, um, and everybody was laughing like as I read the questions. So he got it right away. But I also I, think that he enjoyed uh, really making me sit. There. I went into the, your YouTube archives and the first wrestling interview that you posted on your channel uh -huh. was Triple H. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that 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 sounds about right. Like, yeah, because Triple H used to come in and do Opie and Anthony, too. So he's one of these guys that I've known forever. But um, this was a press conference. This was like you took him aside after a press conference and did an interview with him. Yes. Yeah. He's very confused when you asked him what's the haps. <laughs> yeah. See, that was such what's the haps was such a gold mine for. I mean, and it continues to be. It was a gold mine with Brock Lesnar. But like. <laughs> I mean, it's just such a terrible question to start an interview with because like <laughs> it's so annoying and you don't even really know what it means. And like, what are you going for here? Like, are you trying to be cool? Is this like a are you being annoying? Like, what do you why would you say that? Um, so, yeah, I figured out pretty quick that asking guys what's the haps was going to be my thing <laughs> for a while. I mean, the first like big thing that I remember was probably that press conference and I, I did like a montage of like different interviews that I did at that press conference. And I was asking yeah. everybody, what's the haps? And Paul Heyman, who I don't even think was working at WWE at the time, but he was pretty big on Twitter still. He was like, you know, he, he was one of the early adopters of Twitter and developed a really big following. And, you know, he's Paul Heyman. So right. he ended up tweeting the video. And I don't think I'd ever, I don't think I'd met him at the time, but he tweeted out the video just because I think he and whoever was around him at the time thought what's the haps was so weird and funny. <laughs> and that happening was huge. That was like the first yeah. big thing. Like that was just mine and it was just in the wrestling community. And it was like an acknowledgement from an icon. So that was probably the first thing that I think of that was huge. And that was just mine. And it's interesting when you break into that, niche you know you and i are very much a part of this niche called pro wrestling but it's interesting that you have a background where like you know, you've been on mainstream radio for you know your entire career yeah. but then you find this like niche and you become accepted in this niche and you're among your own people and it's like ah now yeah. i'm on to something <laughs> yeah 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 it feels better and everybody everybody like at first they like you because they're like, oh, this guy could be one of these guys who gets wrestling interviews and wastes the opportunity, but, but he doesn't. Like, I think that, that, cause I know as a fan, like I, if I saw somebody, like if I saw you get an interview because you're on the news and you ask dumb questions, I'm like, well, that was a waste of time. Like, why, yes. why would you do that? And so you get excited when you see somebody that actually asks great questions and does this great interview and uses the opportunity for what it really is. I mean, eventually yeah. they turned on me, but. No, they haven't all turned on you. But you you also kind of embrace this. You have like this, it's like a heel persona that you have. Well, I just, I just like reactions. And, you know, it's not necessarily that I'm like, oh, I'm going to go be a heel guy. But like, when I saw the amount of backlash that I could get for what I thought was not doing that much, like I, I didn't do any work to stop it. You know, because I kind of got a kick out of it. Was WWE egging you on and saying, yeah, 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 play a little bit, play that up a little bit? Well, they, they at, at, at that point, what made me kind of shift was that they really made it clear that they were like, we don't, we didn't bring you here to like be, do an audition to be a WWE guy. We don't want you as a WWE guy. You're not going to be a WWE guy. That's not why you're here. Like, we like you. We want you to just be you like this is and and I kind of took that in and I was like, like, wow, like what a, what a 
blessing, what an opportunity that people just don't get to come in and don't worry about fitting this form. Don't worry about like stories that you've heard about how everybody has to fit this mold. Like just you've been you for all this time yeah. doing other things that you've been doing. Just come in and be yourself. Yeah. And I was like, all right. And I started thinking about it and I was like, well, what could I do that would make me me? And I was like, what, what if I just gave my real opinions? What if I didn't worry about like, you know, a soundbite or, or hitting a post or selling something or whatever it was? What if, I, you know, I let the professionals that are there to do that and do it better than I do anyway? What if I just let them do that and I just come in and just run my mouth because I can do that, right. you know? And I was like, yeah, let's let's try this. And then when it got a reaction, I was like, well, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. You know, this is, <laughs> this works. I mean, you obviously had a working relationship with WWE for many years. You know, you were interviewing a lot of their talent, but when did you start having conversations with them or when did they start having conversations with you about bringing you in and actually working for them? Um, it was, I mean, it was a few months before I did it really. I mean, there'd always I'd always, I'd been around, like you said, forever. I'd gone to shows. I'd, you know, I'd met so many people. I'd auditioned. I'd sent in tapes. I'd, you know, I'd done everything. Like there's, there's, I'm sure if they really dug, there's plenty of footage that they have of me trying to worm my way into a job that just didn't work at all. So, and I, you know, kind of stopped that and gone like, well, I don't even, I don't, maybe that's because that's not what I do. Maybe I'm just not good at being that guy i'm just good at being me so let me focus on just being me like i have my wrestling podcast i'm on the radio i can do these interviews like that's really that's really pretty good so i just started doing that and one day i just got a call from michael cole who i'd known for a long time and you know and he he was like look dude i told you i've been i've been trying to get you in here for a long time and, you know, and you never know if that's just something people are saying to be polite or if it's yeah. true. But either way, just the fact that that's the sentiment I'd always appreciated. And he was like, you know, I I, I we want to bring outsiders onto the kickoff to just try something and just see if, like, you know, having that outsider opinion is cool. Would you want to come in and do it? I was like, <laughs> yes, Michael Cole, I would love to. <laughs> yeah, the answer and was, you're going to pay me? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Although if you read the Internet, they don't pay me. So I, I would not I don't want to. I don't want to ruin that urban legend either. Right. That, that is, <laughs> did you think never, this was just, did you I think never, this was going to be just one show? It, that's all it was. I mean, oh, okay. you know, and they said, they said, if it's, they said, maybe we'll bring you back if it works and maybe we won't, but just go out there and kill it and have fun. Yeah. Like, just go have fun. And I was like, okay. And you know, I, I didn't know how it was going to go, but you know, ahead of time when I got to kind of, talk to Renee and Booker, really, those were the people that made me realize, like, this is going to be really fun. Like, yeah. you know, I, these people are amazing and they're welcoming me and I, I, I they're going to allow me the opportunity to just go have fun with this. And, you know, I mean, from the beginning and it's still my philosophy today. It's like, if this is one show, if I'm on the kickoff show once, yeah, that's fine because they can never take that away from you. Like yeah. once the, once that show has been aired, for the rest of your life, you did it like you got there. So it's yeah, like yeah. everything after this is icing on the cake, but this is it. So it's like every every time you go in, every time I do anything for WWE, I'm like, this is amazing that I'm doing this right now. Like, I don't even know if people can fathom how unreal this truly is for who I am. And so if this were the last thing I ever did, I don't want it to be. But if this were the last thing I ever did, I did it. And that's amazing. I mean, you did commentary there. It's crazy. You hear, crazy. He, so here you are four years later and yeah. you're still doing stuff consistently for WWE. There's got to be like a pinch me moment. And we haven't even talked about the fact that your show is on the WWE network, which is, I mean, congratulations to you on that. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, the, the fact that there's still, like I'm still having conversations where I'm sitting there going like, this can't be real. Like you can't seriously be Okay, like I'm not going to correct you on it, but this can't be real. Um, yeah, I mean, the it's it's literally still every single time I do anything, like every Thursday when Not Sam Wrestling shows up on the WWE Network, I wait until 10 a.m. and I pinch myself. Like every single time the show comes out, it's a pinch me moment. Every time I do something for that show that I didn't think I was ever going to get to do, it's a pinch me moment. Every kickoff is a pinch me moment. Every 
time I go into a commentary booth is like a pinch me 10 times moment. Like it's every time I step into an arena, every time I go into a, a, a locker room, it's, it's nonstop pinch me moments because I think like, I, I think if you lose that, you lose the whole reason that you're in this thing and, and it loses. I don't know. I, I, I'd never want to lose that. I don't want to be too cool to have those pinch me moments every single time I do something. Now that your show's on the network, is it still the same show or are there any restrictions that have been placed on you? No. So, I mean, the beauty is that not Sam wrestling on the WWE network and the not Sam wrestling podcast are still two different shows. So every week I do the not Sam wrestling podcast. And then every week I also do a show for the WWE network, not Sam wrestling on the WWE network. And uh, you know, it's it's amazing because there really are no restrictions like they they came to me with this idea and they were like, you know, we want we we again, we think that this perspective that you bring isn't on the WWE Network right now. And, and you know, we think you have a way of of talking about this stuff that's really interesting and we want to try it. And, you know, but we want you to produce the show yourself. And I'm like, that's not a but that's like an addition. Like you're you're at, you're saying that I get to produce it myself. Yeah. You know, that's like a that it's it's even more that's another pinch me like i so i get to write the show i yeah. get to produce the show i deliver the show to them you know when i deliver it and that's that's the relationship <laughs> like i get to create the show that i think should be on the wwe network and then they put it on the wwe <laughs> network <laughs> it's wild and, and now are both shows kind of helping each other grow uh yeah for sure you know i think like not sam wrestling is I think not Sam wrestling works best as an audio show because a lot of shows I don't even have guests on anymore. A lot of shows I just go and I keep it pretty topical, pretty, you know, current product centric. And I'll just go for an hour yeah. on whatever. But you know, when I thought about doing it on the WWE network, I was like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't like the idea of me sitting in front of a microphone at a desk for an hour and then that's the show. Like that yeah, doesn't yeah. seem like that's a TV show to me. And you guys are giving me the opportunity to do a TV show. So the WWE Network show, I, I, I looked at as more of almost like a kind of hybrid podcast, talk show, variety show right. type of on, thing, but just all centered around wrestling fandom. On the interview bucket list for you, and this, this can be wrestling or otherwise, who did you cross off and you were like, I, I can't, I never thought I'd get that person and here I am talking to them. Well, Chris Van Vliet was one of them. <laughs> and uh, yeah. that's at the top of everybody's list. Yeah. <laughs> um, Undertaker, you know, I, I, so, so technically, so I've, it, technically I've interviewed Vince McMahon twice. They were wow. three minutes each, but you know, coming from the world that we come from, it still counts. Of course that counts. That counts. That counts. Yeah. Counts. Wow. He's, he's number one on my list now. Yeah. Even if you get him for three minutes, right? It's like. Even if I got him for one question. Right. Still counts. You know, um, The Rock was the same way. I know you've gotten The Rock a few times. I got The Rock once for th like three minutes. Still I saw counts. it. Yeah, WrestleMania 28, right? It was either 28 or it might have been 27. 27. That's right. 27 press days. conference. Yeah. Yeah. But so, yeah, so that that was definitely so. But once those get crossed off, I mean, yeah, The Undertaker and The Undertaker always was on that list anyway. But yeah, I mean, for sure, without question, um, having interviewed The Undertaker and done a real interview with The Undertaker and really just sit there and talk about wrestling for an extended period of time. Like, yeah. that's a thing that yeah. I never, never thought was going to happen. I think it's easy to ask what your favorite interview is, but I'm actually interested to know what your favorite moment is of any of these interviews you've done. I like that question. Um, I mean, that's not my favorite moment because you're doing the interview, but I do like the question. Um, <laughs> my, uh, no, my favorite moment, actually, it's, it's definitely this moment I had interviewing Shawn Michaels because it changed my entire perspective on the way I look at wrestling. Um, this was before he came back to do that tag match uh, with Triple H and the Brothers of Destruction. This was, I think it was before he was even back training at NXT. He was like promoting some signing or something like that. And I got to, you know, do a phoner with him. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Talk to the Heartbreak Kid. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I was talking to him about like, you know, man, you're, you're still in good shape. 
you know, I know, and, and there's guys out there that, that want to run AJ Styles is talking about this. You know, do you ever see a context where there could be something that pulls you back? Like the, at least gives you the itch. And he kind of broke down really. And, and, and like, it was just off the top of his head. Like it didn't even occur to him that he was breaking ground, at least to me when he explained that, like he looked at the Shawn Michaels character and he looked at the road that character had been on and the, the end of that character arc losing to the undertaker was so perfect that he mm. didn't want to ruin that. And the way he explained it, it was the first time, like I had this aha moment where it's like, wait, the Shawn Michael, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. This is the stuff that like, I love, I love it. The Shawn Michaels that came into WWE in like 1988 or 89, whatever it was, the rockers, Shawn Michaels with Marty Jannetty is the same character that retires at WrestleMania against the undertaker. Like there, mm. there's one clear line and you could sit there and you could go like, you could talk about these, these little storylines. You could talk about like Sean's story with Mari. You could talk about, you know, Shawn Michaels and Jericho. You could talk about all the different storylines that Shawn Michaels has been a part of. But when you really pull back, you realize there's this one arc that stretches all the way from the rockers debut in the WWE until Sean loses the second WrestleMania match with the undertaker. It's one long arc and you go, and that's what made me go like, Oh my God. And it made me start thinking about all. It made me start thinking about the undertaker differently and triple H differently. And all these characters that you can draw that enormous arc over the course of decades. Yeah. You, this is what makes wrestling so amazing. I completely agree. And now I'm thinking of all kinds of different characters differently now, as you say that, yeah. Unfortunately, though, there's a lot of times when they try to make us forget about that thing that happened a year or two or even six months ago. And sure, it might still be on the same story arc, but they're going, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, don't don't mind that thing that happened over here. That, that don't worry. Thing. But well, yeah, we don't want to get into specifics. We just yeah. we just we just but, look at the wide arc. Like like, for instance, like Kane's arc would start at Kane. Like it would start at Bad Blood 97. Like you it wouldn't, wouldn't start at Isaac Yankum. No, because that's yeah. Glenn Jacobs. Like that's right. that's not, we're not talking about a character anymore. We're like Isaac Yankum is a character by himself. Fake Diesel is a character by himself. And then Kane begins at Bad Blood 97 and goes all the way until current day, really. It, it, what's so interesting is we forget as wrestling fans that these are characters. Mm -hmm. You know, and, I, and, I, and we don't do that in acting. We don't do that in movies at all. We don't go, Brian Cranston, oh, you know, he's great as, you know, he's great in Breaking Bad, but you don't think of him as Walter White. In wrestling, Michael Hickenbottom is Shawn Michaels and Shawn Michaels is Michael Hickenbottom. And it's this very weird gray area that just keeps getting grayer and grayer. Well, yeah, I mean, it's also like, the work that goes into some of those characters is so often ignored. Like, I mean, I think when, you know, you talk about Emmys, like I've been thinking about this more and more when, when I see the Emmy awards give Emmys to other award shows, as if that's the best live produced show of the year. I'm like any episode of raw is more complicated than any award show. And they do 52 of them. And then they also do 52 Smackdowns. And then they also do 52 NXTs. Like, like the, the, the amount of, of I think kind of ignorance that a lot of the industry has to what's going on in wrestling uh, is astounding sometimes. But yeah. like when you talk about characters and, and the way like, yeah, it's amazing. We give Brian Cranston and Brian Cranston, by the way, deserves it, you know, cause it, Brian Cranston's unbelievably talented and breaking bad is one of the best shows ever. And, and what makes it so, one of the things that makes it so great is you look at Walter White and you never see Brian Cranston. Yes. You just see Walter White. But like, look, at the same time, as ridiculous as some people think wrestling is, I interviewed The Undertaker. And then I went and I watched an Undertaker match. And I was like, that's not the guy that I interviewed. I don't, yeah. I never, I never talked to that guy. I talked to a different guy. And, and that's when you realize how much character work is being done here on top yeah. of the fact that they're destroying their bodies. Well, the, the interesting part about this is you did an interview with Mark. You didn't right. do an interview with The Undertaker. Him. I never call him that, but yes, yes. But, but this is what's so strange about wrestling is you talk to Mark, everybody still calls him Taker. Yes. It's a really, that doesn't happen in any other industry anywhere. Right. Like, like it'd be so weird. When I was interviewing Undertaker, I was calling him Undertaker and Taker. When I interview Xbox, I know Xbox like a friend. 
but I've never in my life called him Sean. It's always X Pac, always because right. that's how I know him. But like, if I was interviewing Brian Cranston, and I was like, "So Walt," he'd be like, "What's wrong with you? Why did you call me Walt? Like, that's not that's a character's name. That's not my name." That's what's so strange about this. Yeah. It's also the reason we love this as much as we do. Yeah, because you. I mean, the suspension of disbelief exists so much more when the performers start to live these characters, when you, even like the smartest fans start to have trouble differentiating yeah. the character and the performer. I mean, that's when it's like, that's when you've got 60 year old men that are watching this that know that have been watching for years and they know how it's done and they know all the tricks and you still are looking at their faces and they're yeah, still yeah. completely taken away by whatever story is being told. So where do you sit on the kayfabe is dead, kayfabe should still be a thing? Kayfabe is the best. <laughs> kayfabe <laughs> is the best. I don't I, I don't think kayfabe's dead at all. I think that I think that people who say kayfabe is dead are kayfabing. Like I, I think Ooh. that there are, I think that there are like there are different lines of it now and where you you almost let people in to a degree so they think they know but they really don't like there's still that other level that you're still keeping away because it's like it's safe to bring them to here. And like you can't sit there right and go, well, no, this is real. And that guy's really my enemy. Like now you're treating people like idiots. Right. So you can't do that anymore because there's there, there's too much out there. But there's still there's still a line. That you can go to that keeps like kayfabe or whatever you want to call it. So I think. I think when people say specific people, there are some people that just don't believe in K, which is fine. But I think when when experienced wrestlers tell you kayfabe is dead, you better look really closely at what they're telling you. Mm. They're probably working you. Mm. It's like a magician. Yes, yes. Where he's like, he'll show you, yeah, one of the tricks, just so that you think the other trick is legit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is getting deep here. Wrestling With is so deep. Oh yeah. It's With like, all this said, across all of wrestling right now, who do you think is the best at keeping kayfabe? Well, I mean, look, like I think uh, I think Paul Heyman is really good at keeping kayfabe. I think that that Paul Heyman figures out a way. Even when you see him doing interviews, like when he was representing Brock, he was representing Brock in those interviews. Now he represents Roman in those interviews. I think Roman is really good. You know, I, I think that Roman has finally found this spot where he can exist, you know, that character, even like, I, I think he did an interview with, with, with Corey Graves on his podcast. And there was still this element of tribal chief in that interview where it's like, you can watch this and kind of believe it. You know, mm. I think, uh, I think JBL is really excellent. I think when you can turn the internet on you as a bad guy, yeah, I think that that's, better than people realize it is. And maybe because people don't want to realize that it's being done on purpose. Like they don't yeah. want to do that. But like, I think when you look at Triple H, right? Like Triple H was one of the top, most popular good guys in the company at a time. And then when he started his relationship with Stephanie, fans on the internet started to turn on him. And we're like, oh, he puts himself over and he does this and he does that. And so that I think gave way to this evolution character triple h where the character kind of started embracing that backlash he was getting and so it all becomes this thing where yeah the internet doesn't like him and yeah he's getting booed but that's because he's the top bad guy he's supposed right. to right yeah you start to you, you start to lean in yeah to that thing i think that that's where it gets really really interesting and really cool i'm very curious to know what you think the worst wrestling storyline of all time is Okay, that's, I don't really think in those terms, but I'm sure I can come up with something. I, I mean, I, there's got to be something right on the top of your head and you're like, oh yeah. Um, the worst wrestling storyline of all time. Well, like, it's interesting because you look at the, like the Bobby Lashley, Lana wedding storyline. To me, I, it wasn't the worst of all time, but to, it, it just popped into my head because to me, I think the say people are really unfair about that segment because I think the wedding segment was excellent. Like I think that the segment itself did everything it was supposed to do. It got everybody talking. It got people tuning in. Like I, I thought the segment was excellent. 
the problem was that the story didn't go, really go anywhere after that. Um, but I don't, I, I would have- Rusev, Rusev told me there was no payoff. Right, he me, right. He told me there was no plan. It was a one-time pop. Yeah, yeah, and it worked as a one-time pop, but then you go- But then you went, where so we what's go? the story with Liv Morgan here? Is, is, there, is there more? Right. Nope. Or, nope, or where it. does, what does this do for Rusev? What does this do for Bobby? What is this, you know? Yeah, yeah, so I think that that's important, but the worst storyline of all time, I'm sure it'll come to me. That's why I'm trying to stall <laughs> and think of something because it's going to absolutely come to me and I'm going to like text you or something and be like, oh, I just thought of it. <laughs> oh, I'll add that in later. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll like make a video for you to just like add at the end of this interview. And by yeah. the way, I'm, I'm, you know, one of the most positive people when it comes to watching wrestling. I think a lot of people, unfortunately, just focus on the things they don't like about Raw, SmackDown, Dynamite, NXT, whatever it is. I like to go, yeah, yeah. Maybe you didn't like that one or two segments, but like eight of them were really good. Okay, okay, okay. Here's one of the worst things in the history of wrestling. Uh, the alliance to end Hulkamania. Uh, WCW, 1995. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it was 95. Uh, I want to say it was uncensored. Triple cage match. Um, it was the alliance to end Hulkamania, which was when the Dungeon of Doom, the Four Horsemen, Zeus, and the actor that played Bane all came together. Not... Tom Hardy, but the original Joel Schumacher Bane. All those forces came together to try to destroy Hulkamania. And you just watch this thing play out and you're like, this is absurd. <laughs> it's like the whole way through, it's absurd. And then you get to the main event and you get to the pay-per-view and it's literally all of those people I just mentioned. The entire Dungeon of Doom and the entire Four Horsemen and Zeus and the actor that played Bane in the Joel Schumacher Batman facing Macho Man and Hulk Hogan. It's and pretty like, bad. Yeah. And Macho Man and Hulk Hogan, of course, end up winning. But what really makes it insane is that, you know, in a match like that, you would probably start with your weakest and go to your strongest, right? Like, you know, save the best for last type right, of thing. Right. The hot tag. Yeah. Yeah. Ric Flair started <laughs> and Bane ended. <laughs> it was the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> You got a lot of heat for that moment in the WrestleMania 34 pre-show. And, you know, when, when you, you know, you fumbled on your words, I looked at that as a broadcaster and I said, I know exactly what's going on there. Someone was talking your ear. Is that, was that what was happening? Well, okay. So you're, so you mean my, my action? I mean, the action, action, action on the way, lots of action. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Not only was that, it was my second WrestleMania, but it was the first time that I had done something that was not just going to be on the network, but also on the USA network. And it was the first segment of that kickoff show that was on the USA network. And that's when it all went wrong. So what happened was it was obviously, it was obviously live. I don't think I have to tell you that. Vic <laughs> Joseph often tells me that that was the first, uh, that was the first time he got to commentate a WrestleMania match. And I ruined it by giving him that because I went straight to Vic Joseph That's after funny. that. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, it was live, obviously, and I was in the middle of the crowd and the earpiece went out halfway through. Oh. And the instructions on the segment changed as the segment was happening. And so then the earpiece came back in and there was like panic and they were like, okay, Sam, we're not going to do that thing. Just tell them action's on the way. And I was like, and action's on the way. And they were like, no, say that at the end. And I was like, oh, uh, and uh, action's on the way. And I just handled it like somebody who had never been on live TV before. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I, that was one of those, that number one, like first I had to get over it. Cause like, I, so, so that happened and I was like, oh, that felt really bad. And then I was like, but, but I'm also very self-critical. So maybe this is one of those times where that felt really bad to me and nobody's going to know what I'm talking about. And I get back to where the pre-show podium was and <laughs> they had, like the match was going on. So Renee, in a, Renee, in a, Renee Young in a concerned way, not in a make fun of me way, in a very concerned way, just leans over and goes, what happened out there, man? And I was like, oh, it was as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> and, so, and, and so then I was like, okay, I have to get over it. And then I was like, okay, at least I'm going to be able to, play this on the radio and let people make fun of me and make good content out of it and and do all that and it was 
it was a, a very, very valuable learning experience, as corny as that sounds. No. Because I had to sit there and go like, OK, that I can never that can't happen. Like you can't have WWE put you in a position of trust. And then that's what you do on their live television. Like you grew up watching WWE. This is to me, WWE is like excellent at broadcasting. OK, so like for me to do that, I'm like, I can't I can't that can't happen again. So it's one of those things now where if I'm on live TV, no matter what happens, I have to be able at least somewhat eloquently to get out of whatever we're in because because that that completely fell on me and uh, I did not handle it well. I think the other thing is, you know, from from what I was seeing is it looked like the segment was supposed to be longer and the instructions got mixed up and then you wrapped up the segment and they weren't ready to go to the next thing. So then you're standing there on camera doing what you're supposed to do. Always keep eye contact with the camera. <laughs> they didn't know what to throw to next. So then it made you look even worse. Yeah. When that moment where I go like, <sighs> like now my, well, <laughs> uh, my, friends, my friends send that as a meme. Like when they're like, Hey, you want to go out on Friday? And they just send the meme of me going, <sighs> <laughs> if you had said actions on the way, boom, it cut right to Vic Joseph. Nobody would have thought anything of it, but right. it's the fact that they didn't know where to go next. And then there was that awkward five seconds of you. Maybe it was four seconds. I don't know. Of you standing on camera. It was being an hour like, and a half. I'm pretty sure it was 90 minutes. I don't know how long it was. It was probably. the entire pre-show. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. Yeah. But I mean, you know, that's why there's a person there that counts you down. You're supposed to follow their count. You're not just supposed to stop. Yeah. But look, I think what also makes it tough is that was at the start of the show. Yeah. And if that was at the end of the show, you would have gone, eh, yeah, we got him, get him next time. It's at the start right. of the show. Now you got to think about that for the rest of the show. You have to sit in it. <laughs> like you just, yeah, just got to marinate in it. Yeah. Like why would they, ever, why would they, first of all, you should go find a seat in the arena somewhere because you have no business backstage after that. <laughs> you know, like that's, <laughs> that's what's going on in my head. I shouldn't even be looking at any of these people. These yeah. people are all busting their asses for WrestleMania, and this is the performance I give them, is terrible. Well, un unfortunately, and we've all had those moments, right? I've, I've had many of them in my career. The thing that always gets me is nobody realizes that there's a producer and there's a technical director and there's a director and there's a cameraman and there's a floor director. They don't realize there's all these other people behind the scenes and maybe someone else wasn't doing their job, which made it look like you weren't doing yours. And I'm not saying that's the case here, but it all falls on you. It does all fall on you, but I also feel like it should all fall on you because if it doesn't all fall on you, then Chris, our only job is to just talk on camera. Like we have to do something that is work, right? Because otherwise you get right, all the right. glory because you get to be the person that's on camera. So right. I absolutely feel like, you know, if somebody behind the scene and nobody behind the scenes dropped the ball on this one, but if somebody behind the scenes did drop the ball, I would still take that on me because I should take it on me because you know, you get to be the one in a tuxedo at WrestleMania telling people 150 times that action's on the way. So <laughs> there should be something in that that is not just a treat and a joy. Well, I was saying this as me going, I understand where you're coming from and I sympathize and empathize with you in that moment. That I can appreciate. That I appreciate yeah. very much. And, I, and of course, anybody that has done live television, I don't think they're looking at that going, Oh, I've never seen anything like that before. They're just like, yep. It's like a comedian. Like when you see a comedian bomb. Yeah. Other comedians take joy in that because they've all been there. Like it just, yeah. happens. it just happens sometimes. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I feel like we could talk for hours and hours and hours, but we're actually going to do another interview with the roles reversed. So for anybody who's listening to this, watching this right now, where can they see that other interview? Uh, that other interview will be on Not Sam Wrestling. Uh, that'll come out. Uh, Not Sam Wrestling comes out every Monday, wherever you get podcasts. Um, just look up Not Sam Wrestling. Uh, I also like I sporadically keep my Not Sam Wrestling YouTube channel up to date. It's really not uh, the heavy hitter that it should be, but um, I'm 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 now rejuvenated uh, in terms of my enthusiasm for the Not Sam Wrestling specific YouTube page. So eventually the interview that you and I do will be up there. Um, I'm also going to start posting snippets from the WWE Network show on the YouTube page. Uh, of course, the new Not Sam Wrestling episodes drop on the WWE Network every Thursday at 10 a.m. So if you haven't watched it and you just, I mean, look, like 
I'm so happy with the WWE Network show because like I sent them a show where I do a 12 minute monologue about why Doink in 1993 only is one of the greatest characters of all time. I and watched it and it was hard to disagree with you. See, but just the fact that that exists on the network, yeah. just that you've got a wrestling fan that's just sitting there talking about how great Doink is. Like this week on the network show, I ended up going 22 minutes. So I was like, okay, I want to do something to celebrate. The show was themed around family. I want to do something to celebrate the Brothers of Destruction. So let me let me just tell, you know, because like I said, I love these character stories. So I decided to go on and tell the story of The Undertaker and Kane and Paul Bearer and the debut of Kane. And it was like 22 minutes long. And it's just me telling this story. And I mean, I love that content. I love the fact that that content exists now on the WWE Network. It blows my mind that it exists. Um, and hopefully, you know, that's the type of stuff that you guys enjoy. Do people still think you're the lead singer of the Sam Roberts band? Canadians do. Canadians. Ah. That drove me. Dude, I'm, I'm so, I found out about Sam Roberts, the Canadian rock star when I was, I mean, when I was in college, he's been around forever. This guy's career will not die. Like all I want is for Canadian rock star, Sam Roberts to like have his moment in the sun. I don't want to take anything away from him. I want to take food off his plate, but like have your moment and hit the bricks and let me like do my thing because he won't go away. He just keeps getting more popular. Well, there's, yeah, that's the thing in Canada. You know, Canada has this thing on radio called CanCon, Canadian content. Uh -huh. And 35% of the music that is played on the radio has to be from a Canadian artist. You know, that's that's why technically Sirius XM and Sirius XM Canada are two separate companies. Yeah, like they that's can't exactly why. Sirius XM in Canada, because you would need to have 30% Canadian or 35% whatever it is. Yeah. And, and like, you know, we're not just going to do that on Sirius. <laughs> like, so Sam Roberts... The musician is never going to die. I'm sorry. I know he's not. I know he's not. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure. Such a pleasure to chat with the last professional broadcaster. So thank you so much, Sam. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Well, there we go. Sam Roberts, ladies and gentlemen. And it's so interesting to hear how similar his path in broadcasting has been to my own path. That idea of clawing and scratching your way to get an internship which hopefully one day might turn into a job behind the scenes, which then eventually leads to a job on air. And then you get to do this really cool thing of merging your two passions together, your passion of broadcasting and your passion for pro wrestling together into one job, which is, yeah, I'm so grateful to be able to say it's what we do now. So a big thank you to Sam Roberts for sharing his story with us. And the reason I'm wearing the podcasting uh, headphones, got the podcasting mic in front of me here, is I'm about to record the podcast version of this interview. All my interviews are available on my podcast. Just search for The Chris Van Vliet Show, wherever you listen to your podcast. But I was also a guest on Sam Roberts' show. So yeah, I, I, I interviewed Sam here, and then Sam interviewed me on his show, which is called Not Sam Wrestling. So wherever you listen to your podcast, check out Not Sam Wrestling. They're two Great interviews, but two very different interviews. So I encourage you, if you have some time today, go check out that interview. And a big congrats to Sam for everything that he has going on in his life. And a big congrats to him for getting his show on the WWE Network. You know, you know how cool that must be to have your podcast on the WWE Network? I mean, he just interviewed the Brothers of Destruction. I gotta say, I'm a little bit jealous of that. But yeah, to have Kane and Undertaker, which separately are already amazing interviews, but to have Kane and The Undertaker together for one interview, my goodness, that's some good stuff.